Coming up next on This Week in Radio Tech, Corny Gould is with us, and I get to ask Corny the philosophical questions about audio processing. Chris Tarr is here, too. He's got a lot of great audio processing experience with all the major brands, and we're going to have a lively discussion about Corny and his 40-year journey uh, in audio processing and where things stand now. It's coming up next on Tort. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Broadcasters General Store with outstanding service, savings, and support online at bgs.cc. By Broadcast Bionics with the Bionic Studio, including talk show control, social media, and visual radio, Broadcast Bionics brings exceptional audience engagement to radio and TV. By Angry Audio. Audio problems disappear when you get angry at angryaudio.com. By Nautel. Worry-free transmission you can count on with outstanding control, reliability, efficiency, and Nautel's unmatched 24-7 customer support. Online at nautel.com. And by Max Connect Wireless. Prioritized high-speed internet service designed for transmitter sites and remote broadcasts. Welcome into This Week in Radio Tech, the show where we talk about everything from this microphone to that light bulb at the top of the tower and the stuff in between. And today we're definitely talking the stuff in between. I am delighted to be here with you. It is the Thursday before Christmas. What is today? The 22nd of December, uh, 2022. I'm Kirk Harnack here in the Telos Alliance studio in Nashville, Tennessee. Thanks a lot, Telos Alliance, especially to Cam and Marty and uh, uh, Frank Fody and everybody else at Telos Alliance for helping me take a, you know an hour or two off on Thursdays to get this show done and bring you, my fellow engineers and radio lovers, um, interesting information about the world of radio and broadcast technology, audio technology. Too. So that's it from here. Uh, we're waiting for the big, big cold to show up. It's supposed to get down to minus one here in Nashville tonight, although it's got a long ways to go. It's 49 degrees just outside the, this studio here. Uh, in the in Nashville, Tennessee. So we're gonna t- we'll do a temperature check with a couple of our friends. Chris Tarr is here from Muckwanago, Wisconsin. Chris, I'm delighted to see you, buddy. How you doing? Ho ho ho, y'all! Uh, we're <laughs> up here uh, up north. It is uh, three degrees currently in Muckwanago. Uh, we're actually getting close to a a blizzard uh, warning here. Uh, the temperatures are dropping. It's snowing. Winds are supposed to get up to 50 miles an hour up here. So. Uh, not supposed to get a ton of snow, but just enough where when the winds kick in, it's going to white out everything. So we're getting ready to get kind of messy up here for the next day or two, but you know what? Yeah. Live in Wisconsin. We know how that's like. And I, you know, one of the things, <laughs> interestingly enough, I enjoy winter now. And what happened was, uh, earlier this year, my wife and I were talking and we're like, you know, she got a promotion and, you know, we were, so we we're talking about a little, like, you know, a little extra money. We said, well, with some of this extra money that's coming in, what are the things we absolutely hate to do that we just don't ever want to do again? And it came up with mowing the lawn and shoveling the, the driveway and the sidewalk. So now we have somebody come over our lawn, and then when it snows, we have somebody plow. So bring it on. I'm ready to go. <laughs> good. That's, that's good that you and she talk about um... – you know, what, what should we spend this little bit extra, extra money on? What's important to us? That, that's a great conversation to have. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, these are just real, you know, inexpensive things. It doesn't, you know, we have a small driveway and a small, uh, small lot. So, you know, it's not like a ton of money, but yeah, we just mm-hmm. said, you know, obviously we put, you know, we put more in savings. I mean, we just had the discussion. So if we could fix one thing that drives us crazy, other than replacing me, what would we do? <laughs> and that's what we came up with. Well, it would cost a lot to replace either of you, Chris, and I'm sure Amy feels the same way, and you feel the same way about her. All right. Well, good. Uh, ooh, it's it's three degrees right now. And what's it going to get down to for a low temperature overnight in Maquanico? Uh Below zero. Below, I don't remember how cold it was. It was uh, yesterday. I was, I was a little farther up north, and we were down to about 10 below overnight. So with the wind chills, we're probably looking at 20 below at least. Uh, I am, I'm scratching my head at thinking how the weather service is calling for minus one. Um, Cause right now it's 40, literally it's 49.8 degrees uh, here at, uh, at Harnack central. So yeah, I, I'm pulling up the, yeah. I'm pulling up the weather forecast here. Yeah. It looks like actually minus 10 is going to be the air temperature. So okay. that'll be the air temperature okay. overnight. And then tomorrow's high two. 
Well, I, I just looked to see, I uh, looked at this, this complete multi-layered forecast, and for here in Nashville, here's what's going to drive it. We're going to have 40-mile-an-hour winds tonight around 9 p.m. and coming from, from your direction. Actually, from the northwest. Coming from Montana. Oh, you're welcome. We're going to have Montana winds. <laughs> Good Great. Gosh. It'll smell <sighs> like cows and corn. <laughs> Let's bring in our guest. He's here. It's uh, Cornelius Gould. I've been waiting a while to talk to Corny. Hey, Corny. It's good to see you. How hey, are you? how's it going? All right. I'm good. Just, I'm good. And right now, it is uh, 39 degrees right now where I am here, uh, just north of Akron. And mm -hmm. on tomorrow, the, it's going to go from 39 to minus 4. So Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Uh, you guys getting snow in Cleveland or not? Or there's like, well, I don't know about Cleveland down here. We've got a little dusting here and there. Um, where I am, I'm just outside of one of the, the secondary snow belts. So the weather here is, can be mm -hmm. radically different from Cleveland at times. Gotcha. Depending which gotcha, way the gotcha. wind blows. Ooh. <laughs> a lot depends on which way the wind blows. I mean, yes. everything from broadcast towers to uh, which, which runway is active. So a lot of, a lot of exactly. things about that. All right. Well, hey, welcome into our audience. We're going to have a good show because we've got a lot to talk about and some learning to do uh, from Cornelius. And I know that uh, Chris and, and, and Corny can't wait to, to go at it either here talking about audio processing. Part of the show, I'm just going to be listening in. Hey, we're brought to you in part by our friends at Nautel. And the, the, the Nautel, the, the online parties are over for the year. So our friends at Nautel just want you to know about uh, a couple of important things, the, the new VX series of transmitters that they have and all the resources they have online. And some of those resources are in the form of uh, eBooks. And I, th I think... Uh, uh, I think Suncast, yeah, they got ebooks about maximizing your FM coverage. That's that's important to learn about. Uh, there's a, a fall product planner that was for last fall, 2022. But I like this one: nine mistakes to avoid when you're buying a transmitter. Of course, these are from uh, you know Nautel's perspective, but Nautel really has the pulse of the industry. That is, that they talk to you and me and other engineers about what they want to see in broadcast transfers, and that's kind of what resulted in the in the VX line. And I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, uh, hit on Chris a little bit, see if if, uh, if if Chris can tell us about his favorite resource on the Nautel website, because Chris, I, I think you've got a couple of things that you really like about their site. I do. The NUG, the Nautel Users Group, is fantastic. It's free to join. Just put in your email information, and uh, you don't get spammed or anything. Uh, but they have a whole toolbox worth of just great uh, online tools for you inside of the NUG. Uh, obviously, they also have manual software updates and that sort of thing, too, for their transmitters uh, and support. But they've got these, like, uh, they have a radio coverage tool that I use all the time. And what that does is it allows you to model Obviously, it's not you know FCC grade or anything else, but it's it's a great free modeling tool that allows you to kind of play with what ifs with number of bays and power and height and, and all these different things and create coverage maps that look a lot like the Longley Rice maps. And again, it's just great for kind of playing around with well, what if I did this or what if I moved higher or lower or you know there's a situation where I had a listener who was saying the signal wasn't coming in uh, at their house and. I, I did a did a map and did the terrain and showed that there was some terrain shielding there based on the the map. So a lot of great free tools there, uh, completely free to use. All you need to do is register at the Nautel Users Group, NUG, as they like to call it. <laughs> Cool. Thanks a lot. Thanks to Nautel. You really sponsor so many things in our industry. You go to uh, so many state shows, regional shows, NAB, uh, SBE functions. Uh, you'll find uh, Nautel there sponsoring something. So really, you know, look, give back to them. Support and Nautel. Yeah, Chris. As you say, and by the way, too, like with their, their uh, questions about transmitters and stuff, they're very good about being, uh, I, I want to say, vendor agnostic when they talk about things. Generally, they don't get into a sales pitch for an hotel gear when they do these things. It's actually very good, neutral information that they present. Uh, you know, uh, if if um, Jeff Welton uh, ever ever leaves Nautel, he's got a great career in copper strap, ground rods, and, and, and ferrite uh, rings. Right. <laughs> exactly. He could be a salesman yeah. for that. Yeah, exactly. He can he can do those things. All right, thanks, Nautel, for sponsoring the show. Hey, uh, Corny Gould is here. Corny, uh, 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 our big topic here is you, you. You and I talked about, and and I 
you know, there's a lot of facets to this. There's a lot of directions we can go and places we can cover. But to me, the overall topic that I want to talk about, because this is what I think of when I think of you and audio processing design, Corny, I think of what is it that makes audio sound good? And we can, we can go with the uh, three shot here if, if, if you want to, Suncast, because I'd like to get everybody in on this. Um, the, there, well, I'll I'll back this up just just a hair. Uh, you know, Corny's been been working on some processing for decades, literally decades. He's much older than he looks, and <laughs> and when the first time that I really You're heard, <laughs> I really heard Corny's processing was was when he put that G Force uh, addition when that when that got put into the Omni Eleven. You could update the Omni Eleven with with G Force processing, and the first time I heard it, had the headphones on, listened to a song that I was very familiar with. And I'd heard it processed lots of different ways. I enjoy the song. I think it's a Fleetwood Mac song that I was listening to. And I heard it through, uh, you know, some of the good stuff that Corny does. And I say some because he's got more up his sleeve. And my jaw dropped. I, just, I literally sat, I was sitting right here, looking back here. I had the Omni, uh, the Omni 11 sitting right here. And my jaw dropped because I thought, wow, that is exactly how I've always wanted that song to sound. That, that I mean, that that is the best that I've ever imagined. That song could say every every. Not that you could hear. Yeah, it brought some things forward, but I, I I almost can't describe it. Corny, it just it just it made my brain and my ear and it just made me happy to hear the song that way. There was zero annoyance. It was better than listening to it straight off the CD, and. And not only zero annoyance, it made me happy. How, what was I hearing when, what's a, what about the dynamics was I hearing that made me go, oh, I really like the way this sounds. Uh, so I'll, I'll shut up a little bit. And Corny, why don't you kind of say hi and, and introduce your, your philosophy about this? Because it worked on me. Hi. Um, <laughs> part of what was going on in G-Force was, um, you know, when I when I was working on the, in, with the project, with, well, when I got into DSP in general, one of the challenges I I was um, set up for myself is to figure out how to bring forward the best of the analog sound into DSP. And the way the DSP works is that it doesn't like when you make an audio processor or a compressor in DSP. Yes, it will turn down things and turn it back up um, when needed, but there's a certain um, bit of of um i'm trying to find the right word that i'm looking for there, there, there are certain characteristics that we've become used to over the years and and especially those of us who worked with analog processors over the years and and so it was a matter of how do you recreate that analog sound so um between the original omni 11 release and the g-force release that was like the early stages of me figuring out how to reproduce some of those those that that analog magic, if you will, and bring it forth in the DSP. So what you heard on GeForce was the beginnings of that work. And, and, and the things I figured out at the time were able to bring forward the, the dynamics, um, control and characteristics on, to the next level for the first time in something that came that was approaching analog. So that's kind of like, no, that's kind of like what I'm at to. It's, it's interesting that you say that because that really, I think without, you know that 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 really described just now put the light bulb on 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 kind of what i've been thinking of earlier digital processing and where things have gone lately you know my complaint has always been with dsp processing that it sounds surgical that it's very mm -hmm. precise and clean and there's no there's no character to it it works really well right. and you can get very loud but there's no you know i, I don't want to say warmth because it can be warm but there's really no character to it you know you you would take if you were to take, you know, five 8100s, set them all exactly the same way, they all sound a little different. And, yes. you know, there's yes. always something about each character that you can kind of, you can take that and you can bring that out and make that part of your secret sauce or whatever and, and use mm -hmm. that to your advantage. And we got rid of that with digital. So it's interesting that you say that because that, I think that really describes kind of, you know, the way G-Force and some of these newer things work. And I, I never really could put my finger on it, but when you explained it that way, that really does make a lot of sense. Yeah, part of the, the challenge with uh, when, you're, when you're trying to translate something from analog into digital 
is that in the analog circuits, um, even though when you look at an analog circuit of a, of a compressor sidechain or whatever, you kind of think about what it does in isolated form. And DSP will, when you build it that way, the DSP will run each of those in isolated form. But what re, in reality, what happens in your analog side chains is that every component does something that interacts something ahead or, or before or after it in some way, um, whether it's a, a diode that's isolating this stage from the next, when the diode is conducting, then the impedance changes everywhere. So that affects whatever is going on on the front end of the diode. So depending on how your circuit's designed, uh, that plays a huge role in how the sound changes. And so uh, the G-Force was trying to bring forth some of those characteristics that happen in an analog sidechain. And, and with that, and when I did that, I was finally somewhat happy with, you know, what uh, the, the 11 sounded like when it came to G-Force. And, um, and, you know, and for my position when I was there, the, you know, as far as I was concerned, everybody needs to switch to G-Force. You know, forget about the old stuff. The G-Force is the magic. It's got the, the analog stuff that makes me happy going on. So, and I was able to take things to a new level and experiment and come up with new ways of expressing that um, processing sound beyond what you could do in analog at the time. So that was a lot of fun. I, I got some questions about Corny, you, you like other audio processor designers, I'm sure you listen a lot and you probably listen to your favorite passages. You probably try new passages. You probably know of some music passages that can cause trouble for some audio processors and maybe even earlier versions of, of your own. I'm, I'm trying to get a handle on understanding your own, uh, auditory process for saying that sounds good. That doesn't sound good. Um, you know, sometimes you, you find a person in any discipline whose sensibilities seem to be spot on. And I got to say, you know, uh, the one of the founders of our company that, that I work for, Telos Alliance, and that would be Frank Foti. Frank seems to have a really good sense of if Frank thinks it sounds good, a lot of people will think it sounds good. Um, mm -hmm. And you, you probably say the same thing about Bob Orban. You know, Bob, uh, you know, uh, uh, came up with, with some good designs early on, especially in the analog world, uh, of doing some things that people thought either couldn't be done or, or were difficult to do. But I think you know, Frank's recognized, widely recognized, and, and so are you. But I'm a little bit curious. You know, you every designer, uh, Leif Clayson, for example, uh, every designer has a little bit different emphasis. And so I'd like to understand more about what is your emphasis? What do you listen for? Because what you like, when, when you say this sounds good, a lot of people agree with that. Tell me what you think that process is, is like for you. Um, let's see here. I like um, I, the processing. I, what I like in audio processing is I like a processor that could work on things and do a lot but not sound like it's doing it. So I, I, I don't like the sound of hearing the multiple bands moving up and down all the time and, 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 and um, or, or being, you know, drawing attention to themselves. So one of the things I was really happy with in GeForce is that I finally got, say, the limiters to work the way I want, where they could do a lot of activity, but you don't really hear them doing what they're doing. And some early on with the early beta testers with uh, GeForce, they thought that something was broken because these meters can't possibly be showing me what's going on because I don't hear it like that. And so well, that's the whole point. So that's one key thing. I, I like it when I can hide what's going on in the dynamics behind the music. Another oh. thing I like are clear, clear vocals. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I like the vocals to stand up. I don't like them being washed out or pushed back in the mix, which happens with a lot of audio processors. I like the vocals to be up front um, if they're up front in the recording. Um, and another test that, you know, I do, no matter what I do with the modern music, if it sounds really good and modern, one of the things I would do is to go back into the stuff from the 80s. And the music from the 80s is produced in such a way that if your, press, if your dynamics are not spot on in the way they're working, it'll end up sounding like radio did in the 80s on those songs. And what I mean is you, you could take a classic thing like a Phil Collins song with gated reverbs. You know, he's one of the first to do that, but then everybody started doing that in the 80s. And what you end up with a, with a lot of processing or processors is that material, the drummer is just not really all that clear because the, the way the processor reacts to the gated drum tracks causes what I call the, the sound of the drummer sound like he's continuously falling down in the back of the studio and everything is just crashing all around. You can't really hear the details under, for the reverb. And so if I can... 
go into a modern day song and then go into the 80s and have the drum tracks and things sound like they do or close to the way they do on the CD, then I know, okay, we're on, we're on to something here. It's not like you play something from now and you go to an 80s track and the 80s track sounds like completely different from, you know, any other era. So that's one of the, those are some of the key things. And there are, there are specific songs and, and all that from the various eras and genres that I, that I generally play with to test out sound. But that's kind of like generally where I, where I generally start. We're talking. It's interesting. We were, uh, I was going to say, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I was talking to, uh, my coworker, Dave, who runs the company and, you know, we've been putting in some new processing and, uh, we had actually that, that very discussion yesterday, uh, as I was driving home and had a lot of time on the road, we're talking about processing and, and, you know, he's a big fan of how I set up the processing at our stations. And it's interesting, you know, again, how you mentioned that, I think, you know, you and I have very similar ears, it sounds like. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of, I believe that uh, you are you can be loud by being dynamic. And, you know, most people get a processor, they put it in, they turn everything to 11. It sounds loud, but after a while, if everything is loud, nothing is loud. So, right. you know, I, exactly. I, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan, especially of, of what you've done in GeForce with being able to you can still process fairly aggressively, but you don't have to crank everything to 11 because there is some of that analog feeling to it and those things that you can leverage to give a dramatic sound that makes it sound loud without it actually being, you know, the loudest thing on the dial making your ears bleed. And I think, you know, we talked about um, early on with the chameleon, that was one of the things that uh, when I put that in, um, that really drew that out. I was actually able to turn the processing down a little bit, actually, uh, to really bring that out. But yeah, I mean, I, you know, when we talk about, uh, you know, processing and favorite things to listen to and the difference between 80s and, of course, now with today, with everything being pre processed at the studio, mm -hmm. uh, you know, yes. you can really get into trouble quickly. Uh, but so many times, and I won't, you know, I won't bring up any offenders, but there are even specific chains where the, the MO is just turn everything up, turn the clippers way mm -hmm. up, you know, get the needle as far to the right as possible and walk away. And to me, I mean, they, you know, okay, you know, ear to ear, station to station, they're louder, but they're certainly not any, you know, they're not pleasing to listen to. And after a little while, you end up going away because you can't, you can't take it. And I would much rather have, you know, the, what the artists intended, which is, when there is a, a dramatic part, you feel that. And it's not necessarily that much louder than everything else, but there's some drama to it. And and I guess it's mm -hmm. the best way to put it. I like my audio dramatic. And, <laughs> you know, it, it can be consistently loud and dramatic. Um, you know, you just don't brick wall everything. So, um, again, yeah. that's why, you know, I appreciate what you're saying with how you test things is, you know, for those of us who that's kind of the theory behind it, it, it sounds, you know, the results are great, I guess is the best way to put that. We, we, we've got to yeah, we got to break for a second here, and uh, okay, I know, we'll make I know money. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> they have a greedy capitalist. We got to make money, pay some bills. Uh, when we come back, we're going to hear Corny's response to what Chris Tarr said, and also, um, well, I've I've got more questions for Corny that kind of have to do with with uh, what some people call secret sauce, and I don't know what Corny is willing to answer. I I just don't know. But there's 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 some magic here in audio processing. I know there is, because when I hear see, Corny's processing, I just go, "Ooh, I, just, I, I like that. I like that." See, you you made the mistake of letting me come on the show today with Corny <laughs> to co-host. Because I'm like his biggest fan. So this is like I'm totally geeking <laughs> out listening to all this. So here you go. We're gonna we're gonna take a, a couple minutes off and hear from the, the great folks at Broadcast Bionics. By the way, Dan McQuillan, the founder of Bionics, is going to be our guest in, in a few weeks. Here, uh, going to be uh, talking about some really really cool stuff on how to build infrastructure for your broadcast facility. But we're gonna be uh, here from Broadcast Bionics. We'll be right back. Welcome to the Bionic Studio. The Bionic Studio brings all audience interaction to the fingertips of a production team in radio, TV, and podcast. Our workflow-led system is working 24-7 around the world for small broadcasters and national and international networks. Our telephony module, Bionic Talk Show, allows cost-effective centralization, remote operation, scalability and resilience across an entire network of stations, but at the same time is used in single-studio self-op environments. 
Social media curation and activity is now considered a broadcast critical part of programming. Bionic Social means the studio isn't overwhelmed with a wall of interaction from an ever-growing number of social platforms. We combine SMS, MMS and email together with a speech-to-text service for listeners using smart speakers. We enable studio teams to curate, filter and display all platforms in one place and post text, images and video content to multiple platforms in one operation. Effortless collection of video content with Bionic Director has helped position some of the world's most successful stations as leaders in viral content, generating appointments to listen and free marketing via retweets and shares. Bionic Contest enables end-to-end -end tracking of on-air competitions, live reads and prizes. These could be on-air contests, automated SMS entry or online. Anywhere and Skype TX for Radio brings high quality audio and video contribution into the studio with ease. No need for dedicated PCs to run different applications. Everything is controlled within the Bionic Studio UI. And incoming connections are visible to users along with all other platforms. Our codec integration enables connection, algorithm configuration and directory to a wide range of IP and ISDN codecs. The Bionic Studio, a unique suite of products designed to enable your talent to work smarter. Thanks so much to Broadcast Bionics for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. Uh, so many innovations for broadcasters come from Broadcast Bionics, and you need to check them out because you can be your station hero, helping the talent uh, make great broadcasting pretty much by doing what they do now, but there's so much more revealed to them that they can put on the air and they can turn that into social media output uh, pretty much, again, with what they're doing right now. Thanks a lot to Broadcast Bionics for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. All right, it's Kirk Harnack here, episode 624 of Twerk. We're here with Chris Tarr, our usual co-host, and Cornelius Gould. And, uh, Corny, uh, okay, you and Chris were, were, were talking, <laughs> and uh, uh, maybe you can answer what, what Chris was, was asking about just before our break. Um, let's see, I'll, I'll add to it a little bit here, mm -hmm. um, to, to kind of, to kind of add to what Chris was saying, um, like so much of the music that's, uh, produced today now is so tightly peak controlled that you almost don't need an audio processor for what well, you, the only thing you need an audio processor for is pre-emphasis and, 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 and control of that, uh, case in point, there was a station that I was doing an Omni 11 upgrade and they did not have their backup processor in there at the time. Uh, they had the, they loaned it out to a sister station who was more destitute. So in the, whose main process went down, they had nothing. So their backup was at a sister station at the time. So we were going to do an Omni 11 upgrade and it's like, well, what are we going to do while the upgrade's happening? We're just going to go off the air. And this is like in the middle of the day and the chief goes, I'll just patch the dust hill right into the transmitter. And I was coming. Kind of like, okay. So he did that. And, um, and the board, I must have been really watching the meters because it wasn't really a problem. But the thing that struck us was that the modulation was perfect. It was like 99% modulation on just about everything that was playing. It's just, it was just dull because there was no pre-emphasis. Yeah. We kind of looked at that and it's like, wow, that is some heavily processed <laughs> music <sighs> that we're playing on the station. So, um, so, so to add to that is, you know, one of the things that I've, that uh, Catfish and I noticed that when we're playing around with the, the with the chameleon stuff on the streaming, when we play the top 40 music, um, that neither one of us really listened to top 40 because we just didn't like what we heard. And you put on a radio and it's like, oh, that sounds terrible. And you just don't listen to it. And you write off the whole format. But the one thing we noticed was that, yeah, the, there's a lot of processing in the music, but, you know, what's been happening with the radio is a lot of the top 40 programmers just add way too much processing on top of the of the songs that are already there. So the songs just sound like, you know, just a distorted mess. But if you don't do that, you notice that there's a lot of detail and a lot of work that goes into those songs that were kind of interesting, a lot of ambient stuff that goes on on these hit songs. And so we both gained a new appreciation for the current crop of new songs. It's just that, you know, there's just, for whatever reason, a lot of programmers just like to really crank and crank and crank and just make the needle stand still and it just doesn't work with that stuff. So it just wanted to add to that with um what Chris was saying. So um so yeah. Just I'm I'm Chris, there's there's a question I want to ask before before I get out of the way for a while and let let you two go at it for a while. 
And that is, you know, most engineers who have looked at audio processes, we get it that there's there's wide band gain control and there's thresholds and there's compression and there's downward expansion and there's uh, attack time and release time. And those can be fiddled with in terms of their timing, program dependent release time, a, a common one. And then you have your multibands. Uh, you, you divide the audio up into, into you know, low, medium, high or more bands. Uh, and then you act on each one and you design the different bands to maybe uh, be either a feed forward design or a feedback design. Um, so you design those. And again, with uh, attack and release times, so then you put them all back together and you have some limiting and then maybe some hard clipping. And, and you know, you can read textbooks about this and, and, and you can take textbook designs and plug them in. But just taking textbook designs and a textbook processor doesn't necessarily make it sound good at all, uh, as most of the text of uh, the processor designers can tell you. So Corny, my question for you, and, and look, I get it if, if you really can't answer this, or if the answer is maybe is disappointing, maybe you just know how to <laughs> tweak those parameters that I just talked about. But my question is this, is there more to audio processing than meets the eye on the meters and displays and controls in a typical audio processor? And, and, and I, I got to believe there's a little bit more to it because... I've tried adjusting some processors, you know, back when you and I, you know, were working for the same company and you'd say, let me in there. I got a couple backdoor controls I'm going to play with. And oh my gosh, it's like it got better. And I don't know what you're doing. I have no idea. So, <laughs> and so I'm not interested in, okay, if you have a, this processor, do this or this, that processor, do that. I'm more interested again in the philosophy, what's going on inside your head is, and I know you've talked about having different parts of the processor inform other parts what they're doing. Hey, I'm having to work too hard. Could you maybe pick up some slack over there? So uh, is, is there more to it than what we see and what we as typical engineers know about? That's what I'm curious about. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, there is. Um, and, you know, a lot of the, uh, the stuff you were talking about where, you know, Processors can, you know, where the different bands can communicate with each other and, and, and keep, keep each other out of trouble and all that. Um, like, you know, you, there's definitely a lot of that going on in the Omni 11 and some of the um, state information that comes in from the front end that talks to the back end. Um, yes, there's a lot of that, that goes on. And we could show you on meters what's going on with that, but not a lot of it will make it make sense, um, except for maybe to me. But everyone else would just kind of like get over, would become overwhelmed. And most people, with something, when you give them like an, an Omni 11 or any other modern day DSP processors, they're already somewhat overwhelmed as it is with all the choices and the things they're seeing on the screens. And so, um, so, so some of that stuff, we just, if you don't really need to know about it, you just kind of hide it. <laughs> you know, use this control, it does everything you need to do there. And, um, and as far as the backdoor stuff goes, on the um, or, or first iteration of the Omni 11, the orange screen one, um, there was a lot of that that I that I was doing for people um, as as we go to different formats and, and some things. Just a lot of the backdoor controls or set ranges and things on on some of the controls to help it deal with whatever uh, material was that we were dealing with at the time. And so one of the things with GeForce was to get uh, away from that. So by the time GeForce was released and we got to like the last few releases of that, there was very little backdoor things that I would do at all anymore. And that's when I knew that, you know, okay, we, it, the GeForce has arrived, you know, it's, it's, it can handle things on its own and there's enough controls for the users to use in a simplified way to, you know, like those, uh, the, the, I think we call it quick tweak controls on the 11. A lot of those controls are moving a lot of parameters that I would have been adjusting in back doors and earlier versions of it. So once we got to that point, I, I knew, okay, it was it was doing what I wanted to do. And a lot of that has to do with some of the adaptive things that I, I put into the uh, GeForce algorithms. And, um, and they were kind of like really simplified versions of what the chameleon does. Not that I didn't want to put that in there. It's just what I was able to figure out at the time. Yeah, uh, to to kind of add some of what I do into an Omnia product. Chris Tar, so, yes, uh, <laughs> you're welcome. Yeah. To, welcome to, to carry on. I've 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 got one of the answers. Uh, I'll have more questions later. But Chris, if you want to expand right. on I, that, or if, if I and if I don't 
if I don't answer something because I might get lost and totally forget a question you've asked to answer, feel free to ask. <laughs> Um, no, I, I, you know, I actually, you, one of the, the, the tips I give when I'm doing processing is I don't even look at the meters because to me, you know, I, the meters are, I mean, they're a great representation of something, but they're not telling me what I hear. They're just giving me static level controls. So, you know, the first things I do is kind of learn what each control does, by just playing with it. Mm -hmm. Okay. What does it do? And I start to learn as I go along, but you know, for example, I had a, a friend of mine many years ago. Uh, adjusting a, an Orban. And he was at one of the controls and he said, well, this number is at this. This seems high. And he said, does it sound good? Well, yeah. He said, then don't worry what the number tells you. It's just a relative right. number. It doesn't really mean anything. So one of the things I found interesting and, uh, you know, I know I talked to, to Catfish about this. You kind of brought this up. I'll see what your version of this is. But uh, with, especially with the Chameleon, the fact that they're there's really only two controls on there. And, you know, he, I think he started out saying that maybe you were thinking of a few more controls on it and he wanted to go the other way and, and make them less. And one of the things that has been kind of going around in the past month or so, as we discuss this is I agreed at first, I was like, I have no idea what this thing is doing. I, you know, why there's no, there's really not much in the way of metering. There's no controls on it. But then I put it in and just trusted that it was going to do what it said it was going to do. And it turned out, you know, it works brilliantly. But I think one of the reasons it does, and, and, and I, and this is kind of my thought process here, and you can tell me if I was wrong or not, and, and this probably comes off wrong, but you're not giving the, the end user anything dangerous. So it's really hard to make that perform poorly. You put it in. And no matter what you set it to, it can't sound bad. I mean, it'll sound different, but I don't see a lot of ways to make that uh, the chameleon box sound bad because there's really nothing to control. And it seems like that's actually as frustrating as it can be for some engineers. It seems to be kind of a brilliant design. Wow, thank you. Um, yeah, so the, the um, chameleon design itself, if you were to break it out with every control that that there is available to people to adjust, it still will be fairly simple. I think, you know, the, the whole thing would end up being about five different controls, five or six controls. And that's about as far as you can really take it. If I gave you any other controls, all, all you'd be able to do is the crash it very easily. Um, you know, when the, when the stealth bomber came out uh, for the first time, and they were saying how the technology, um, the fly-by-wire technology is so advanced that you couldn't possibly fly an airplane like that without the fly-by-wire computer in it. And they were, you know, when they were talking about that, it's like, hmm, that's sort of like the chameleon. <laughs> and the, the chameleon needs to have that smarts in there so that you have something to interface with because so because of the way the chameleon can go zero to 7,000, you know, if it were a car, in like half a second and, and, and all of its ranges are so narrow like that, that you need something to, 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 you know, you, you couldn't possibly adjust the thing, anything in there, um, quickly enough. Or, and if you did adjust it quickly enough, you just get into trouble somewhere else. So there's like a whole system in there that, um, that's, you tell it what to do and it's, you know, by means of various feedback networks in there, it's able to kind of give you the sound you want, but it holds it and adjusts things as needed. And which is one of the challenges to um, doing the chameleon in DSP. Um, uh, Kirk and I were earlier were talking about the um, uh, the chameleon he saw, which I refer to as Grandpappy, the analog one. Um, it's a, you know, full of op amps and CMOS logic. And, and, and a lot of the op amps in there are taking the role of some of the, the, the logic by using op amp logic and some error you know, uh, based control. And that's how I, um, managed to run the time constants there. And the challenge on DSP was to figure out how to do all that, but do it all in 48 killer sampling, right? Because I figured out long ago that, well, to really make this thing run the way it is on the analog circuit, just to pick up the analog circuit and plug it into the, uh, a DSP design, it would have to be running at like at 384 killer sample rates to do what it does. So a lot of that was figuring out, okay, how do I take this and make it operate in the constraints of DSP? So, and so we had you know, chameleon. 
it was interesting. So, yeah, you so know, when I first get back to you. Oh, you, oh, so to get back to you. So when Catfish did he came up with that concept to me, um, he said, Can you make something like that? And I was like, Sounds like a job for chameleon because I can do that with a chameleon, but nothing else. <laughs> so that's what made it possible, <laughs> so, you know. So it was interesting is when we put the chameleon in on the air as a test the first time around, one of the comments we had gotten from one of our programmers was he was hearing things in music that he never heard before. Uh, in fact, I'm trying to remember it was an Eagles song. Maybe it was Hotel California, where all of a sudden you were hearing like, you know, some strings in the background and all these things where he said, I, you know, I've never heard that before. And what's interesting is I didn't really change the settings on the Omni other than I disabled the AGC. So, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting how it's just something as simple as uh, and it, I know it's not simple because I know how much work you put in it, but it's a little black box with a control on it. You <laughs> plug it in there and it, and it does so much. Now, this is the first time I heard that you had an analog. Is this, this is the, the box then that you were, you were doing before you came to Omnia then, right? Yeah. The, the, the other, and I actually had it in my office in Omnia for a long time and some people would hear it and listen to it. And, you know, it's funny because the first comment everybody has, Oh, that's some nice bass coming out of that thing. And then they'll listen. It to does have wow, fantastic that's, that's, bass. That's <laughs> And, um, so, uh, so yes, so, and, and there were a series of them and the, um, the one that uh, most people have seen at this point and uh, pictures of or whatever or heard it, it was the last analog chameleon that I designed before I started to go into the DSP path, but that got put on the shelf for a while when I went to Omnia. So, and I just pulled it back out a couple, uh, about two and a half years ago. So. <laughs> We, uh, we're talking to Corny Gould, and we're going to have to take, a, take another quick break here. Uh, Corny is our guest, and it's always exciting, uh, just the, the things that we learn and the way our minds expand in the, in the audio processing world. Chris Tarr is here. Corny Gould is here. I'm Kirk Harnack in the Telos Alliance studio in Nashville, Tennessee. We're going to uh, – actually, it, it's time that we uh, actually hear about some angry audio audio processing, and for that – I'm going to let Chris Tarr do a little talking here. And after that, uh, Chris, you know, we've got a, uh, we're going to hear from Josh Bone and then be right back on the show. So, Chris, it's all yours. Well, thank you, Kirk. It's fun that we're talking about the Angry Audio Chameleon today because, as a lot of people have seen on Facebook or whatever, I've bought 24 of them for every one of our radio stations. That's how much uh, I enjoy the Chameleon processor. And, you know, there's no such thing anymore as a new compeller or a new Ariane or anything like that. And I'm a big believer in massaging audio before it hits your processor. Modern processor designs are fantastic. Uh, they do a lot of great things. They also do a lot of bad things. And I found that if you can get the audio consistent going into your main audio processor, you can do some amazing things and create some amazing signatures. So what Catfish and Col uh, Corny and Angry Audio did was create this new digital uh, chameleon box called the audio chameleon and there's a couple different flavors there's the original chameleon the c3 for our sorry the c4 is the original guy for live stream processing and that's great if you're doing uh you know thought actually we've just heard now some churches doing it for their live streams if you're a streaming uh, a radio station or even a radio station that has a stream this is a great option for live stream processing it's a nice gentle uh good quality audio coming out of this box perfect for streaming you know, because you don't want to compress a lot when you're doing an audio stream. You need to give the encoder some stuff to work with. The C4 does that. Well, how about if you're doing HD radio and your talent can't listen over the air? It drives them nuts. I know. I've dealt with it. You know, in the past, we'd grab old, old audio processors that had analog outputs, and we put that on there for what we would call fake air. Uh, the Chameleon C3 is the solution for that. It's a great way to monitor over the air uh, program audio, make it sound over the air for your jocks. And of course, again, give them that great Chameleon C3 audio. The other thing about the Chameleon, I, before I move on, very low latency. Uh, it's not like monitoring through uh, you know, a modern digital processor. These have very, very low latency. They work great in the headphones. And then finally, the Chameleon C level, the studio audio processor. And that's the one I just bought several of for our radio stations. And I have found that not only do they make processors like the uh, Omni 11 sing, but they work really, really well with older and not so competent audio processors, such as the Omnia Volt, the Orban. I have one on a 5500 and a 5700. 
they just make those sing. And as Corny mentioned, it's got this deep bass, some clarity. It warms the audio up. It gives you that analog sound. And once you set that level, it stays there. To sound really good without having those variations in level that change everything you've set. So I put mine in front of the STL to make sure that we don't have any peaks going through the STL. And then generally, you know, I'll turn the wideband AGC off or, or down. And I can really dial in the settings of my audio processor to sound great. And from cut to cut, track to track, everything sounds consistent. So there you go. The Chameleon uh, versions, the Chameleon uh, live stream processors, the C3 for headphones, the C4 for live stream, stream for, for, for live streaming. I stole my bronchitis here. And the C level for on-air audio processing. When things get you frustrated with audio processing, get angry. Fix it. AngryAudio.com. Chris, thanks so much. And uh, thanks to Angry Audio for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. Something else that, you know, we talk about and we've actually have for years because it's worthwhile. And some uh, networks have bought a ton of these. Um, we've got a, a couple of these that I use at my radio stations when I need to. And this MaxConnect Wireless, this one right here, kept a Nash, uh, excuse me, a Memphis radio station on the air during their fun drive when the, the uh, cable internet let them down. Uh, I love these things. And by the way, if you if if you have gone out and looked at maybe one of these uh, uh, home internet or business internet um, hotspots that based on on five G from one of the big carriers, you may very well be disappointed. You may find out you don't get a static IP address. You may find out that uh, you you also can't set up any port forwarding. And my goodness, you may find out that you can't even do FTP through it. And we in the radio industry kind of depend on FTP. Well, that's not the case with Max Connect Wireless. Let's hear a quick testimonial. We'll be right back with Max. With all of the recent cybersecurity attacks against large corporations, we were looking for a product that would give us the ultimate security at our transmitter sites and as well as with our broadcast equipment. Max Connect fits the bill very well. Its greatest security feature is the fact that it gives you a single static IP address. Using this single static IP address allows us to close hundreds of open ports on our firewalls across the company and restrict access to only the Max Connect IPs. This has greatly reduced our exposure to the World Wide Web and made us much more secure moving forward. It's also given us the ability to expand as needed in a secure fashion. Thanks a lot, John Tocock, and thanks to Josh Bone for working for the broadcast industry for us as engineers and putting together Max Connect Wireless. You end up using, uh, there's all different styles of 4G LTE modems that you can use, but what the, is the key is the SIM card that goes inside because it connects you to the Max Connect uh, network. They're the ones who are selling this bandwidth. Uh, they're the ones who are have arranged for static IP address and high priority packet delivery. So even in a remote situation where you're maybe broadcasting from a stadium or parade and everybody else is using their uh, their internet around you, your packets go through. And I've experienced that myself in Las Vegas and also in Memphis uh, and in Mississippi, at Cleveland, Mississippi. We had to use one of these and got great results. So check it out from Max Connect Wireless. Thanks a lot, for Max Connect, for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. Corny Gould is our guest. Chris Tarr is along with me. And um, I wonder, Corny, you and I talked uh, uh, before, um, the, before well, during the pre-show meeting a few hours ago. And I, I want to talk about an article that came out. And I, it may have been in Wired Magazine or, or Business Insider, or one of these ma magazines. I, I really wasn't expecting to see this article. And it had to do with, we've all heard it. So many um, news interviews, podcast interviews these days are done, and the guest has a really bad audio setup. Their video looks okay. Maybe they spend some money on a ring light or something, and you know the, the video's okay with their home internet connection. But people don't know much about audio. And so they're using the laptop microphone, or they're using the webcam microphone, and they say, oh, it's a brand new webcam. It's got a mic built in. It should be good. No, it really sucks. It really sucks. And so we hear this audio that, um, first of all, has reverb in it from the room, and you know, they're several feet away from the mic. Uh, you know, this is a $1,000 shotgun mic. I can have it several feet away like that, and it still sounds okay. But these webcam mics are just terrible. They pick up almost as much room tone and, and reverb as the person, uh, as, as they are direct sound from the person. 
Um, and then the codec gets hold of that. And the codec is trying to code all this reverb in the room, and it's just terrible. Um, and our brains, well, the point is, the article says our brains have to work really hard to understand uh, like that. And, and you've been talking on the phone with somebody, and they say, hey, it sounds like you're on speaker. Could, could, could you pick up? Uh, frankly, it sounds like you're, you left your Bluetooth headset in the next room. Could you, could you maybe pick up the phone and talk on that? Um, and so what I'm wondering is, is poor audio quality makes our brains work hard. And, and I'm relating this back to um, not only what I hear with your processing, Corny, with, with the chameleon style processing, but also uh, as it relates to some of these um, audio channels. And I, I always go back to this lo-fi girl which is a, a, a channel you'll hear on Spotify and, and they're on YouTube, maybe other places too, where they've purposely um, uh, cut back on the audio quality and yet it doesn't bother me. It's not, a, it, it's not impairments that make my brain work hard. In fact, it almost seems like impairments that make my brain not work as hard uh, to, to hear and understand. It's comfortable to listen to. Maybe you can address some of that what you know about, what you want to speculate about, I, I don't care. Uh, but some of the, the popular things these days, listen to a track that is, or a station that is Christmas music during a rainstorm and the music is in a different room. In other words, it's, it's as if you're taken back to when you were a kid and your parents were having a Christmas party at the house and you weren't invited in. You were told to stay upstairs, right? Uh, with, with your brothers and sisters. Anyway, I've done enough talking. Uh, Corny, maybe you could address this a bit. And, and Chris, you too, jump in when you when you feel like it about this idea of uh, impairments that make your brain work harder and some other impairments that seem to make things more comfortable and understandable and uh, to listen to. Go ahead. Um, well, it kind of dov to dovetail off of um, you know Chris's comment before with the Eagles track and all that. Um, one of the things that um, when it comes to an audio processor, that takes away from the enjoyment of the music is um, like the wrong kind of intermod distortion on stuff. Now, mm. this is something that, you know, with clippers and all that, Frank was really big and on that. Um, I was, you know, fairly big on that with dynamics, but working with Frank, you know, with the two of us just got to the point where we, we were almost obsessed over intermod distortion and how you can get rid of the wrong kind of intermod. Um, there's good kind of intermod that gives you a sense of excitement. But they're but the wrong kind of intermod takes away from things. So certain details and songs and all that would just kind of get lost because something else is creating it so much distortion that it just takes your attention away from, you know, some of the subtle things. Um, so there's that. Another thing that I like to do in processing, and and it's my my personal um uh, enjoyment of audio processing and, and certainly not with everybody else's cup of tea, but I like having space between instruments. So I like to set the processing up in a way where if, if, if the, if the band were, were a picture, the sound that you're hearing, the, you have the guitar over here, the drum over there and, uh, the bass player over here. And there's like dark space around each one of those instruments. So you can hear each one of them versus the sound where they're all kind of smeared together, you know? So that's the kind of the effect that the intermod um, adds is that smearing kind of effect on the, on the details, uh, you know, on the instruments and stuff. And it just mm -hmm. makes it less defined. And mm -hmm. so when it's less defined and you're trying to enjoy the music, it's making your brain work harder, try to listen through all that um, to enjoy the, what the artists are doing. And that's just, that, that's me and, and people who think like me or like you probably Kurt and, and Chris, there's other people that enjoy that smear and, and that that's the sign of good audio. And, you know, what I, I can't say it's either one of us are right or wrong, but it's just different tastes for different people. Um, so you can, you can extend what I was just saying there to things like the example you gave with the, um, you know, the reverby room and all that, where you're just, it's just, you're, 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 you're listening like this and you find your, this is getting sore, <laughs> you know, because you're trying to yes. figure out what's going on. And, and by the end of the day, you're like, wow. So, uh, <laughs> <sighs> you try um, to do that. Uh, uh, hey, hey, uh, audience, hang on. We're, we're going to, we're not going to show it right now, but in a few minutes, we're going to show a photo of the original chameleon processor that we've talked about a couple of times. Yeah. Well, the, yeah, the last one, the last one. Yeah. I, I have got what's left of the original chameleon, right? Oh, <laughs> oh, okay. Right that, here. Yeah. There's a, 
Uh-huh. Uh, this, that's okay. the original. So, um, and, and these holes were where pots were. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> on, yeah. On the, right? yeah. So these are all like all the controls that you had on that one. And that was like the very yeah. first one, uh, the very first chameleon there. So, uh, okay, yeah. uh, r- riddle me this. This is maybe something else I've noticed about this, this kind of a lo-fi sound. Our, yes. our brains and our ears are really, mm-hmm. I, I think, really good at figuring some things out. If, 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 if I'm in a room with great speakers listening to, to well-done music and, and it's pleasant and, and, and you, you know, it, it's, a, it's a good experience. If I go into another room, I can still tell that that was good quality audio from the other mm-hmm. room, right? You can be three rooms away and you can, your brain, I mean, we audio engineers, we kind of know, we realize that, that that was some good audio over there. And so even th- two rooms, three rooms away, it can still sound pleasing and make us happy. Now, mm-hmm. if it started out as crappy audio, there's uh, nothing's going to make it, you know, right. m- convince us that it's good. Being three rooms away doesn't make that really any better and may, maybe worse. So I, I, I don't know, I guess I'm ex- just exploring this idea of why does familiar or good music that you know is being reproduced well, why does that still f- create good feelings in us when we're not hearing it well because we know of, of our environment? We're three rooms away. We're upstairs, you know, with our brothers and, and sisters, but we know there's good stuff going on, you know, somewhere else. <laughs> does that make any sense to you? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna circle around to that in a second because one of the things I I you brought up lo-fi and it's one of our you know whenever we have conversations with each other you you always wonder why the lo-fi sounds so good to you yeah and <laughs> and so with the lo-fi music is that a lot of that it's it's lo-fi is kind of a misnomer it's really more of a different style of music so it's not shiny it's not glitzy it's mm-hmm. it's intentionally created to with the, with the with a limited set of tools, a limited uh, palette of colors, and the artists are just being creative within that boundary. So that's why you like it. So it's kind of, it's not so much about the frequency response of what they're doing as, as it is the artistic, you know, um, expression using limited palette of tools. Um, it took me a while to get used to John Lennon music <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, so much with stuff he did in the 70s, you kind of wonder, what were, they, were they high or something when they were doing that studio? And, you know, and, and, you know, when I mentioned it to my dad, one of the yes, things he they says, were. well, that, that was intentional. Well, he says a lot of that was intentional because John Lennon wanted to rebel against the glitzy, shiny sound of, of music. And he just intentionally did gritty stuff. And once you knew that, okay, that was intentional, then you can appreciate it. He, yeah, he, he's probably was high too, but, but a lot of what was going on was, was intentional there. Um. Now, as far as, you know, listening to music in, in another room and know it sounds good and all that, one of the things that um, to remember is that the, the world's best microphones are our ears and our brains are doing a lot of processing to what we're hearing. So we can tune out a lot of annoyances that, of, from listening to a song from across three rooms away um, or even in the same room that you're in, like a room that you're just talking to somebody and sounds perfectly fine to you throw a microphone in the mix and there's all this reverb and echo. And that's because a microphone can't discriminate what it, what the intention is, <laughs> which is the other person talking from everything else in the room. So there's that too. And, and that's also part of you know, what fa- a long, long fascination with me, which goes all the way back is the fact that what we hear and what we see are not really what's happening in reality. So we have our own, processing in our visual and in our, in our auditory um, senses to recreate the world in the way that we can understand it. So a lot of what goes on in the chameleon is, is I take advantage of that and hide a lot of what it's doing by doing things in a way where you can't really hear it or it might happen faster than you're used to hearing it or then faster than you can perceive it even. Let's, uh, now's a good time to take a look at that, that picture. Uh, Suncast, if you can pop that up, tell us what we're looking at here, right okay. in the middle of the screen, with that studio chameleon. Yes, so sort of the lower third of that picture, above the studio amplifier, there is the last um, analog chameleon that was built up, um, and it still exists. It's it's still running over in the rack room there, and that's and for those of you who are looking at it, it's below the tuner there with the with the radio station tuned in on it. Mm-hmm. So uh, that is. The analog box that uh, that Kirk mentioned there, 
above that are and that, and that one I call grandpappy. So in and at the top of the picture are the whippersnappers, <laughs> which are the, the C fours. <laughs> you saw. Now, now that studio chameleon that's right in, right there, close to the middle of the mm-hmm. picture with with the four band uh, multi band gain mm-hmm. reduction display. Uh, now, would that still mm-hmm. be under warranty? <laughs> well, you know, I had to recap. I had to recap that thing, um, Did you? and that wasn't fun because it was never designed for that. Um, <laughs> like when I show you the the picture, and when I showed you the front panel of the of the first chameleon, one of the things mm-hmm. whenever I'm designing these things, it was never really. Um, I never really thought about where I would be when I'm 50 or whatever. So whenever I would come up with a new one, I would just cannibalize the previous one and, uh, and, you know, reuse what I wanted to reuse from the one and, and stuff it in. And the rest of the parts just kind of go wherever. And eventually you end up with things with holes in it and nothing else left anymore. Um, and so, uh, so with grandpappy there, you know, it was designed kind of along that same step, but I, I was starting to take care in it because I was wishing I had the older one still at that point. So, and the other part of that is I was in the beginning phases of, of thinking about, okay, what is it that's actually going on in this? Because the next one I do is not going to be analog. That was the end of the analog line there. So after that, it would be a DSP based processor. So, so there's a, so there's a lot of reasons why that became, you know, the, the, the gold standard that, all the other chameleon, well, the C4s had to live up to because the C4s are the DSP version of that grandpappy unit there. We're, uh, I, boy, I hate it that we just have uh, an hour. We're pushing the, the show to the limit here. We're going to, you know, we're going to go right <laughs> up until about 10 minutes after, after the hour. So we got a few more minutes, but we got to take a, this uh, last break. And when mm-hmm. we come back, I'd, I'd love for Chris and and Corny to you know to talk about what, what, what you see, uh, you know, what's the current state and where do we see things going next maybe maybe corny maybe chris maybe you got some ideas on where audio processing uh, should be going from here uh, i'm just i'm just d- delighted with with what corny has added to our industry uh, this week in radio tech uh, episode 624 i'm kirk harnack along with chris tar corny gould is our guest and we'll be right back after this from vox pro Hey, what's happening? St. John here coming to you from Command Central and wanted to tell you about the absolute best partner you can have in radio. I'm talking about, boom, Wheatstone's Vox Pro. Lots of different audio software out there. Why Vox Pro? It's the only software designed to do what we needed to do, which is record, edit, playback in real time. When I say lightning fast, I'm going to show you how fast you can edit stuff up in Vox Pro right now. Literally three clicks on the controller, mark left, mark right, everything that gets marked, you hit delete, it goes away it's literally that fast so we're gonna take this part right here Boy, help. Nine. boom from caller nine to him saying i'm ready well, five. ready for that secret sound boom all of that stuff hit delete it goes away here's your edit you are tackling secret sound caller nine i'm ready thank god one of the best features of version 7 this is awesome it's effects macros and you can literally put a chain of effects together so that instead of uh, having to normalize a phone bit and then uh, use noise reduction on it and eq it and all that you can literally build a chain one button this button this one's called call right here i just click that all of those processes happen instantaneously final thing that i love about vox pro and there's so much more to get into but uh, one of my favorite things you can load it on a laptop i've literally done my show from a hotel room in armenia to uh, the conference room at yeah this was fun jury duty great thing no one could tell the difference vox pro makes it totally easy telling you if you're looking for the best on-air partner call my friends at wheatstone ask them about vox pro and you'll be glad you did And the place you need to buy it from would be Broadcaster's General Store, as BGS carries all your favorite brands, and they they know what they're doing. They'll they'll help you get exactly the right tools, hardware, and software, whatever you need, uh, including Vox Pro. Check it out from Broadcaster's General Store. Uh, I just just talked to uh, Shane, uh, the new general manager at at BGS, uh, the other day, and uh, these are some good, good folks with sharp pencils, good prices, and quick delivery on anything that's deliverable. Uh, Yeah, there are supply chain issues here and there with people, but, you know, BGS does a great job of of stocking items so you can have it when you need it. Broadcast General Store at BGS.cc or call them at 352-622-7700. Thanks, Broadcast General Store, for sponsoring our show this week in Radio Tech. and We support you back. All right, uh, Chris and Corny, uh, I'm going to turn over to you guys for the last uh, last few minutes and a few thoughts here, but I'll throw out the idea of 
uh, hey, uh, Corny, your, your 30, 40 year uh, quest to make audio processing the way you like it, and so many other people agree with you, I've gotten to experience it as GeForce and the Omni 11. You've got a line of, of small processors uh, that are used for a number of different things that are being made and sold through Angry Audio. Uh, where, where do you think this is going from, from this point? Um, I think, well, where I've been at since, like, say, the late 90s has been in the uh, streaming world where I, you know, and that's kind of like where I've been wanting to tailor Chameleon into those um various streaming products and whatever you need for the streaming uh, area. So I kind of locked in on that when, you know, with angry. And uh, so that's our big thing. And uh, so, you know, loudness control and things like that have been a really fun uh, new challenge to, to address. And, you know, with me being on the, the, the AES loudness panel and all that, where we're working on, you know, recommendations for streaming standards and ways to do, to do that. So that's been a lot of fun. And, um, and I, for me, that's kind of where I'm where I'm going with things with processing. So um, there may be there are different things for broadcast and all that. But for for years, like my my real love has been you know working with streaming audio because it's like a it's it's new and it's um and there's a lot more to go to, to come with it. So mm -hmm. it's been fun. Chris Tarr, uh, you're a broadcast engineer. You've you've uh, used you know. Broad, uh, audio processing products from all the major manufacturers, and you found a place to put uh, Corny's stuff in in to good use. Where do you see needs for streaming uh, for uh, processing going, Chris? Well, it's interesting. You know, I've got kind of two takes on it. First of all, we've got you know the the younger generation growing up now listening to sixty four k MP threes on earbuds, so you know they're not as consumed with audio quality as some of us are. Uh, and, and then we've also still, I, I think there are still stations who believe in the loudness battle. And I think that is such an old, outdated thing, this whole fight over who is loudest on the dial. I look at it as, um, I, you know, I, I very often don't compare myself loudness-wise to other people on the on the dial. I compare it to drama. So, you know, I, I, I hear this a lot, actually, from people uh, friends of mine who drive through, uh, you know, the area and stuff, they go, I know when I'm listening to a Chris Tar station, I just know because it's got that certain sound and, you know, and it's always been good, but, you know, to me, I think that the, the, where I would like the future to go, I don't know that it's going to go there, but I think that's where the winning stations are going to be is when they start looking at things like audio quality, because, you know, newer cars, they have these fantastic sound systems. They sound great. You know, you can't get away mm -hmm. with that whole, you know, completely compressed audio out to, you know, 15K thing anymore because you've got these, or, or you know, speakers so at the center clipping. of the dashboard. Right, right. Or so much the clipping clip that there's sawdust coming out of the bottom of your speakers. and <laughs> Right. You know, I mean, you've got, anymore. you know, it used to be in the 70s, you'd have that single speaker in the middle of the dashboard that would, you know, and, and you, you processed for that. I mean, that those days are gone now, and we've got these, you know, really high-end uh, high quality radio systems in these cars. And I like to be able to, and, and I'm kind of a fanatic about this. I mean, from the source material out, everything is as pure as I can get it. And then with processing, you know, yeah, I, I, you know, I set some processing, we have some expensive processing, but it's more about the quality of the audio rather than the loudness. And I think that by doing that, you can be loud and clean at the same time, because if you focus on loudness first, everything else kind of falls away. If you focus on clean first, loudness comes along with that. So anyway, that's, you know, my hope is that that is where things are going. Do I really believe that to be the case? Eh, I think there's still a lot of people stuck on just being the loudest thing on the dial. Yeah, that, that's mm -hmm. been, that's been my disappointment, you know, of all the tools you give people to, to sound really good for, you know, um, the people still want to push it to the point where, it's the loudest thing on the dial. And, and there really is not much more loudness to be had for the most part. You I mean, you're hitting the limits of physics. So all they're really doing is just distorting things more. And uh, Right. And, yeah. and really, to be honest, you know, nowadays, who's ever said, I listen to that station because they're the loudest? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. I, I don't know that people actually ever said that. Yeah, I mean, people in radio probably, you, you don't, but people you don't you know, subconsciously so goes, Oh, hey, well, that one's louder, so it must be a it must be better. It's a stronger station. I like that one. 
And th- there was some credence mm-hmm. to that. But I agree with you, Chris. Yeah. When you compare with HD stations and streaming especially, um, that that no longer is a great argument. It, right. It certainly yeah, don't don't want to be that was, yeah. yeah, yeah, no reason to your audio. Yeah. 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 You don't want to fall off the dial where people are reaching for the volume control. You want right. you know, no. there has to be some normalcy, but yeah. But I definitely think that whole loudest thing, as you mentioned, Kirk, it was a different time. And I think now, you know, people are a little more tolerant mm-hmm. of that. And I think, you know, especially, you know, with these these higher end audio systems, people are starting to appreciate quality again. And loudness, if if you have to be fatiguing to be loud, then that that's not worth it. Um, and right. uh, I, I think it's possible, as Corny said, be clean, or maybe you said it, Chris, you know, have the cleanliness and the loudness can come along with it. If you try to be loud and you're grungy or, or dirty, that, that's that's a quick tune out. Nobody likes it. You know, it's, it, it's interesting. A, a, a classic line from Bob Orban, we have volume controls on our radios. We don't have distortion controls. We can't turn right. that down after the fact. So, yeah. you know, yeah. that's something to mm-hmm. keep in mind. Our quality, quality controls. Guys, we got we to go. Uh, we could spend four hours here talking. We, we'd still be yapping. <laughs> so, hey, I, I appreciate Corny. Thank you for being here with us. It's real close to Christmas. I hope you and your family have a great Christmas this year. Thank you. Same to you, Kirk and Chris. And Chris, same to you. Hope you have a great Christmas, too, with uh, Amy and everybody there in, in your house. Hope you guys have a terrific uh, Christmas and look forward to seeing you uh, next week. How are you, too, my friend? All righty. And I'll be here too. Thanks to Suncast the, for producing today's show. Appreciate you being on top of things. And thanks to uh, Andrew Zarian, the founder of the GFQ Network. You'll find other great podcasts. We got to go. We'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye.